What is boiling and how is it different to evaporation? And why do kettles get all noisy just before they boil and then go quiet again? And why can't a liquid get any hotter than its boiling point? And what crazy stunt am I going to try at the end of this video? Keep watching to find out. Okay, we all know what boiling is. It's the point where bubbles start forming under the surface of a liquid as we're heating it up. But most people, and even some chemists, are a little bit hazy about how it actually works. If you've watched my previous video on evaporation, and if you haven't, I'll put a link up here somewhere, you'll know about vapour pressure. The definition is that vapour pressure is the pressure of a vapour in contact with its liquid, but we'll make things simpler and just say it's the pressure of vapour molecules evaporating from the surface of the liquid. Now that vapour pressure depends only on temperature, and as we raise the temperature, that vapour pressure gets higher. Normally, molecules can only evaporate from the surface of their liquid. And that's because any molecules under the surface that have enough energy to go flying off by themselves just end up losing it back to the liquid before they get to escape. Close to the boiling point, however, the chances of many high energy molecules meeting each other are quite high. And that means they can form a tiny micro bubble. But because the bubble is so tiny, it has a very high surface area to volume ratio, and that means that the bubble just gets crushed. And this crushing happens so suddenly and with so much energy that it makes an audible pop. So that is why kettles get louder as they get closer to their boiling point. It's the sound of hundreds, maybe thousands of tiny bubbles being formed and then crushed again. But as we continue to heat the water, more and more molecules get enough energy to break free of the liquid. And that means the vapour pressure increases to the point where it is equal to the total pressure pushing down on the surface of the liquid. In the case of this kettle, that's one atmosphere. This is the point where the rate of molecules evaporating into the bubbles and creating vapour is greater than the rate of vapour molecules inside the bubbles condensing back into the liquid. And what that means is the bubbles get bigger and bigger and reach the surface. So, very simply, boiling occurs when the vapour pressure of a liquid is equal or greater than the total pressure pushing down on the surface of that liquid. And that means that boiling is not different to evaporation, it's a special case of evaporation. One thing that is different to simple evaporation, however, is that because boiling needs to make bubbles, the boiling point is affected by the total pressure pushing down on the surface of the liquid. But the rate of evaporation is not affected by pressure, it's only affected by temperature. The difference is that simple evaporation happens to molecules individually, whereas forming a bubble happens underneath a liquid and a liquid forms a network of forces. So gas molecules or vapour molecules pressing down on the liquid surface over here can work to crush a bubble all the way over and down here. Now this dependence of the boiling point on the total pressure has some important consequences. We say that water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, but that's only true at a pressure of one atmosphere, roughly speaking, sea level. If we're down in a submarine, the pressure might be as high as two atmospheres, in which case the water won't boil until 120 degrees centigrade. And up there on the top of Mount Everest, the pressure is so low that the water boils at only 70 degrees centigrade. So imagine, as well as having almost no oxygen and deadly freezing temperatures, you can't even make a decent cup of tea. And 
out there in space, the vacuum is so low that the water will boil directly from your body heat. So don't try that one at home. Another interesting aspect of boiling liquids is latent heat. Very simply, once a liquid starts boiling, it stays at that temperature until it is completely boiled away. So even though we're adding extra heat the whole time, it's not getting any hotter. Turning up the gas will make it boil away faster, but won't make it any hotter. Now, a simple textbook explanation just says this is latent heat and leaves it there. But let's dig in a little deeper. We saw in the evaporation video that when molecules evaporate, they take with them extra kinetic energy. And that has the effect of reducing the average amount of kinetic energy of the liquid that's left behind. In other words, it cools down. So adding energy faster by turning up the heat increases the rate of evaporation, but that simultaneously increases the rate of cooling of the liquid and the two effects cancel each other out. So we have a negative feedback loop which maintains the temperature of the water at its boiling point. In fact, if you don't keep adding heat, the boiling will cool the liquid down very quickly and it will stop boiling very quickly. These two ideas, the idea that a liquid can't go over its boiling point and also the boiling point depends on pressure, come together in a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker's cook food faster than normal boiling, but without burning them. And that's because inside a pressure cooker, we have a pressure of about two atmospheres, which means the water won't boil until 120 degrees centigrade. So it will cook the food faster. And because we're in a water saturated atmosphere, the food won't burn. And latent heat means that the temperature won't go any higher than you want it to, no matter how high you set the gas. So that's boiling done. See you next time. Ah, it's a little bit more complicated than that. You see, it's actually very difficult for bubbles to get started. We said before, didn't we, that a tiny micro bubble has a very high surface to volume ratio. So one way of looking at that is that the large surface area can push in on that tiny volume. But another way of thinking about it is that what this large surface area means is that it's very easy for the vapor molecules inside to hit the surface of the liquid and lose their energy back to the liquid. But every bubble has to start out as a micro bubble. So how do they survive? A bubble actually needs one of two things to get started. It either needs a tiny cavity called a nucleation site that will protect it from the bulk of the liquid, or it needs a point of low pressure turbulence, a little eddy moving through the liquid. With a cavity, the bubble has a sort of tiny safe cave where it can get started, where high energy molecules can gather and start to push the liquid back out. At this point, the volume of the bubble is the volume of the whole cavity, but the surface area exposed to the liquid is only the entrance to the cavity. This means that high energy molecules can collect and eventually get the bubble to the size it needs to be where it can survive by itself and grow in the bulk of the liquid. And this is why when we have a carbonated drink, we often see a little line of bubbles coming up from the same point of a glass. It's because on that point on the surface of the glass, there's a tiny scratch or maybe a piece of dust, which is acting as a nucleation site, a place where the bubbles can get started. But if you're watching this video, then you must be a smart cookie and you'll be thinking, but what if there aren't any cavities or little pieces of dust? And that's actually a big problem in a laboratory because we work with very smooth and very clean glass. 
And what happens there is that the liquid can't boil. The temperature keeps going up and up and it goes past the boiling point, but the bubbles still can't form. At this point, the liquid becomes superheated and it can cause a very dangerous situation called bumping. You see, when a liquid gets superheated, any small trigger can form a bubble. It might be a piece of dust falling in, it might be even a tiny eddy current formed from picking up the container and that can start our first bubble. Now once our first bubble forms, it's going to move up through the liquid and it's going to leave a trail of low pressure eddy currents behind it. Those low pressure eddy currents are going to allow more bubbles to form, which creates more low pressure eddies and the whole thing goes up whoosh all in one go. In fact, that reminds me of one of the most dangerous accidents I've ever witnessed. I was a teaching assistant, a student demonstrator in a teaching lab and some superheated... Well, I tell you what, I'll tell you that story another time. A little while ago, I promised that I would tell a chemistry disaster story every time we add a zero to the end of the subscriber numbers. And we're nearly at a thousand now. When we get there, I'll tell you the story and I'll also tell you the really unexpected lesson I learned as a direct result. So if you subscribe, you'll know when it comes out. And uh, while we're about it, if you click the like button, it'll help the channel out. Thanks. Now, while we're on the subject of danger, I promised you a crazy stunt, didn't I? I'm going to drink a boiling liquid. Oh, it is boiling. Sort of. Okay. I have to admit, I am a bit dubious about this one myself. Now, a few years ago, I met a chemist from Manchester Metropolitan University called Alan Goodwin, who told me that fizzy drinks are boiling. And I said, no, because obviously that's ridiculous. And then he asked me to explain how a mixture of water and carbon dioxide bubbling is different to any other normal mixture boiling. The mistake that we make is to think that those bubbles are pure carbon dioxide, but they aren't. They are a mixture of carbon dioxide and water vapour. And if we took that gaseous mixture and condensed the whole thing, we would have a mixture of mostly carbon dioxide now, but with still some water. And if we wanted to get pure carbon dioxide, we'd have to go through this cycle of boiling off the vapour and collecting and condensing it. In other words, it's an extreme example of fractional distillation. Now, there is a complication in that carbon dioxide does not simply dissolve into water. It actually reacts with water to make carbonic acid. But I don't think that's relevant to the question of whether or not fizzy drinks are boiling. Now, Goodwin published a peer-reviewed article on this back in 2001, which, as far as I know, still hasn't been refuted. So what do you think? Why don't you let us know in the comments? And I've put a link to Goodwin's paper. So if you like, you can comment first, go and check the paper and then come back and tell us if you've changed your mind. And if you haven't seen the evaporation video, why not check that one out? And I'll see you next time. Does this orange shirt make me look like a convict?